Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Digital Preservation. What does it really look like? Uh, this is the first webinar in our new Learn with Scholars Portal webinar series. And um, this series is really intended to take advantage of some of the specific specialized technical expertise that we've developed at Scholars Portal in topics like digital preservation or like uh, web accessibility, which is what the next webinar in this series will be about. And for us to be able to share some of that knowledge and some of that expertise with the broader OPAL community. So we're really glad that you joined us here today. There will be a uh, feedback form available at the end of the webinar that you can fill out to let us know what you thought of this webinar today and also any suggestions or thoughts you might have uh, for future webinars in this series. Before we get going, I just have a couple of housekeeping notes. First of all, um, we are recording this webinar today. We will be stopping the recording before the Q&A period. Uh, the recording will be shared with everyone who registered today. It will be shared with um, all of the main Scholars Portal and OPAL mailing lists, and it will also be posted to the Scholars Portal YouTube channel. We will also have uh, the slides available. In fact, they are available now, and we'll put drop a link into the chat shortly where you can uh, view them live if you would like to. Um, we are asking you to please keep yourself um, muted throughout this presentation today until we get to the Q&A period. If you do have questions as they come up, you can drop them in the chat and Grant will answer them at the point that he's stopping for questions. Um, otherwise, please keep yourself muted. And if you do happen to unmute yourself, you may find yourself forcibly muted by myself or um, another diligent member of our Scholars Portal team, just to make sure the audio and everything is um, sounding good quality today. So um, also uh, a live transcript is available. So if you want to take advantage of that, you can click on the live transcript button with the little CC logo in the uh, menu bar to turn on that live transcript. That is everything from me today. So I'm going to pass it over to Grant to start the webinar. Yeah, thank you, Sabina, um, and thanks for the invitation um, and interest from the OCL community to, to present this webinar. I'm, I'm really honored to have it launch this Learn with Scholars Portal series. So um, here's an outline of what we're going to be doing, I'll be introducing myself in a bit more detail. We'll be talking about the fundamentals of digital files. I think it's important when we talk about preserving digital materials to know actually how they're composed. Uh, I'll focus on basic strategies for keeping files safe, which is also known as bit level preservation. And then we'll get into key preservation functions and what they actually look like, which is what the, the title of this webinar comes from, digital preservation. What does it actually appear as when you're doing this work? Um, sometimes we talk about preservation in very conceptual terms and the real intention here is to ground it in, in practice. So um, my name is Grant Hurley. I'm the digital preservation librarian at Scholars Portal which is the information technology service provider for the Ontario Council of University Libraries. I've been at Scholars Portal for five years now um, and have really just learned an immense amount about digital preservation during that time, been able to really focus on, on that kind of niche subject area within librarianship. And I'm, I'm happy to share this knowledge with you now. And this webinar is also a chance for me to like, revisit my teaching around this topic and kind of try and um, get better at breaking down these concepts in ways that are hopefully understandable to you. But um, if something comes up where you're unsure about what I'm talking about, or I say something you don't know the definition, feel free to put it in the chat or note it for the Q&A period, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. One thing to note at the start is that um, I'm speaking from Toronto, otherwise known as Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Um, this photo actually on the right, is a renamed street sign um, for the road that's that's quite near to me in Toronto. It's currently known as Indian Road, but it really ought to be known as Makana Anishinaabe, which is essentially a translation of the, that street name uh, into Anishinaabe. So um, I want to note here that digital preservation happens on Indigenous lands. The data that we store in data centers, um, the work that we do, the labor that is involved in digital preservation is happening on Indigenous lands, and it's important to note that um, Indigenous lands support that work and make it possible. So um, at Skull's Portal, I have a bunch of different roles as part of my portfolio, but the broad goal is to support OCO members um, in the preservation of shared and unique uh, digital research collections, 
via collaboration, uh, particularly collaborative infrastructure. Um, and so that breaks down in, into two parts. One is um, supporting shared collections, which are licensed or acquired by OCO members. Um, when those materials have preserva preservation rights assigned, um, we attempt to collectively preserve them um, in this amazing resource, which is the Scholars Portal Trustworthy Digital Repository, or TDR. Um, and our team manages um, the preservation of over 40 million journal articles and eBooks, um, which is no mean feat. It uh, takes a lot of effort to scale preservation to that level. Um, I'm really proud to continue to support the TDR as part of my work and um, include other sorts of content in it as well. Um, when collections are unique to your institution, so you hold them, they're not shared with other institutions in the way that um, scholarly materials are collectively licensed. Um, I also support the Permafrost service, which is a hosted preservation service. Um, as part of that service, which is subscription-based, 11 OCO members have preserved um, just around three terabytes of data um, spread across about 160,000 files since 2018. And that service is growing all the time with new members and, and content being ingested. Other things I do are assist my colleagues in supporting preservation functions of the Ontario Library Research Cloud, which I'll be talking about in a minute, as well as the Dataverse um, repository for research data. I develop training um, resources, advice. I provide advice and technical assistance for OCO members to support digital archives and preservation needs. Um, and I do a lot of collaborative work as well with other networks, committees, uh, teaching, research that's focused on digital preservation work at the regional level as well as nationally and internationally. So enough about me, um, let's get into it. What is digital preservation? Um, I often come to this definition from the Digital Preservation Coalition, which says that digital preservation is the series of managed activities necessary to ensure continued access to digital materials for as long as necessary. Essentially, this is saying digital preservation is a process where you're attempting to ensure persistent access to whatever it is you want to access over time and for as long as that's necessary. So, you know, um, you may be preserving something for a short period of time, um, relatively speaking or in this sort of nebulous forever period, right, um, into the future. One thing I like to point out about this definition though, um, is that if you take out the word digital, um, the definition could really apply to all preservation activities, right? Um, if your institution is in the preservation game, whether um, with analog materials or digital ones, which generally for the case of academic, academic libraries, you are, um, you're doing this work already in some form. Um, putting photographs in acid free file folders and uh, you know, archival box and in a climate controlled area uh, is preservation work. <laughs> That's a series of managed activities to ensure access for as long as necessary. Um, and so the broad goals of digital preservation do not really differ from the broad goals of analog preservation. It's just the functional ways in which we do this work are different. Um, you have to sort of translate the asset-free file folder or the climate controlled vault into some other set of processes uh, to preserve the digital materials for um, what they are. And so the question then becomes, you know, what makes preserving digital different then? If it's similar to analog and its broad goals, you know, how do these things differ? One is that um, there are remarkable levels of mediation between a physical file <laughs> as it is stored somewhere and you as the person who wants to access it. And so for the first part of this webinar, we'll, we'll talk about understanding digital files, I'm breaking, breaking those concepts down a little bit. The next is that, as you know, it's very easy to delete, modify or corrupt uh, digital files, um, but it's also easy to uh, duplicate them. So in the case of analog materials, like if you have a piece of paper, you have to put some effort into altering it or destroying it in some way. You have to get up from your desk and throw it in a recycling bin, rip it up, throw it in, <laughs> throw it away in some way. It takes, that takes effort. Um, it's much quicker and easier to hit the wrong key in your keyboard and the file's gone forever, as you may have experienced, or your hard drive crashes and suddenly you've last, lost access to your, um, all of your files. I'm sure everyone's experienced some loss of access at some point in their life. The benefit though that we have that we don't have with analog materials is that you can copy them exactly without a great deal of effort and provide you to have a storage space. Um, 
in a way that you can't with analog materials. You know, you'd have to photocopy a piece of paper maybe, and that is an inexact replica. We can make exact replicas of digital materials and put them in separate places, which means you can kind of mitigate that ease of deletion, uh, modification, or corruption. And so when we talk about strategies to deal with that basic fact about digital files, we're talking about bit level preservation. And so I'll get into that as well. The last thing that's different, which is also an advantage in many ways, is that we can automate metadata extraction and we can automate format migrations to facilitate the management uh, of these files and access to them over time. Um, again, uh, if you were a digital, or sorry, an archivist work, working with analog materials, you might have a photograph in hand and you'd have to try and figure out, you know, when this photograph was taken, what, um, you know, stock might have been used, what are the chemical components perhaps, of the photograph that could cause it to break down over time. A lot of that information might be inferred or sort of guessed at, um, and it would take quite a bit of time. With digital files, we can actually figure out a lot of information from the files themselves in an automated way, and that will help us uh, inform preservation strategies. And so um, when we're talking about that set of um, pieces of work of a workflow, um, that's when I'm getting into key preservation functions as part of this webinar. So um, we'll get into the first part, which is digital files as links and layers. So um, as I said, there are many layers of mediation between a physical file and you as the person who wants to access it. Um, and it starts with data encoded on a piece of media. So all data needs to be physically placed somewhere. Um, and different media storage types have different methods of recording patterns of information so that you can retrieve those that information from them. So um, there's a photo of a punch card there. That's a very early form of recording information on a piece of paper. Um, floppy disks, of course, have another way of doing that. It's magnetic pulses, essentially, on a spinning uh, disk inside that uh, plastic enclosure. And USB flash drives, again, have a different method um, using um, charges, basically, in small, very, very small cells within that flash drive. Those patterns that are encoded on that media transform into bits, which is the zero and one that you know of when you think about computers, basically. Yes or no, zero, one. When you gather those together, you get bytes, which are eight bits together. Um, and we can transform that series of um, bits from eight into what's known as a hexadecimal value, which is a summary, essentially, of that series of bits. When you group together bytes, you get a bit stream, series of bytes. Um, and again, we can translate those values into a short form called hexadecimal. Suddenly you can start doing things, right? When you have series of bytes, you can transfer, transfer information of some kind. And the simplest way of doing that is uh, using text. So in the earliest days of computing, they essentially figured out how to map that series of zeros and ones into text values, um, which became the ASCII text format. And so I'm going to jump out of the slides here for a second and just show you what that looks like. So we have a text file here called SEP, and it has the words hi, exclamation mark. If we open this up using a uh, text editor, we can take a look at the contents of the file. And it really is just 48, 49, 21. Those are the byte uh, hexadecimal byte values and those essentially correspond to the words, or sorry, letters, H, I, and exclamation mark in the ASCII text format. That's all that there is, there is in this file. Um, and that's how it essentially breaks down. And then um, we can look at um, the binary values here as well. So this is what it breaks down into, into those zeros and ones, that's all it is. Of course, things get more complicated with other sorts of data, right? So if you have um, photographs or video or documents, office documents, PDFs, those byte values get infinitely more complex, right? Um, but just seeing them in text format is a nice way of sort of um, understanding it at a basic level. So once we move up from data encoded on a storage medium, um, as I said, you know, it could be CDs, flash drives, 
someone else's computer as well. So this same principle applies when we're talking about like your local network drive or cloud server. Um, again, the data has to be somewhere. There are an, another series of layers here. So um, you're, you're probably using right now an operating system, um, which is a set of services that connect the physical components of a computer to software. So you know, you've got your keyboard, your mouse, your display, you maybe you have a printer connected. There's memory in the computer as well as storage. Um, networking, which is connecting you to the internet right now to watch this webinar. Your operating system is connecting all these functions. And you're probably familiar with Windows, you know, Mac, those are all operating systems. Operating systems also have file systems, which designate how and where data is stored and retrieved from that storage medium that might be connected, whether it's your hard drive internal to your computer or an external source like a CD uh, drive or a flash drive. It also sets rules from things like file names, um, directories and folders, uh, metadata about files and folders, and any sort of access rules. So if you've ever tried to name a file with a bad character, you got a warning, that was your file system um, controlling that kind of information. Within file systems, we have files, right? And those are structured around the file format, which is the rules and structure for how data should be stored and interpreted by software. We'll get into file formats in a bit more detail in a minute, but you would be familiar with file formats if you've ever used a doc, a Microsoft docx file um, or a TIFF image. Those have standards with which designate how those bit streams should be interpreted by software essentially. Software itself is a collection of instructions that tell a computer how to work, um, including interaction with you as a user for the creation and modification of files. And then finally, we have the output, right? So how files and software in combination are created, viewed, interacted with by you. Um, in the early days, computers had no monitor. It was just straight to a printer, right? Uh, but now, of course, you have a display, and we're really used to using um, interfaces of various kinds in order to interact with computers. So when you have a file on a storage medium, right? Remember back, we're going back to the beginning, some series of bytes organized uh, and stored in a storage medium. Um, all these different layers have to interact and link together in order for you to actually access them. And so when we're talking about preservation, we're often traveling through those layers, right? Starting with the storage medium, making sure we can access the data off that medium, and then working through things like the operating system, the software, the file format, and finally to the output. Uh, librarians and archivists are really familiar with moving information between mediums. Um, that's something that we've done since time immemorial, I would say. Um, but more recently, uh, obviously, the interest is in digitization, which is specifically the analog source to uh, digital surrogates. So this is when you are converting an analog origin of some kind, whether that's a document, a photograph, a videotape, into a, a digital equivalent. And so we're guided by standards, processes, and tools for doing this. If you're concerned with scanners or um, and any other sorts of tools that you're using for that conversion, that would be within this area. And you can do digitization for preservation purposes where the digital copy is eventually gonna replace the analog one or access purposes where um, you're really not concerned about quality. It's more just to ensure that somebody can, can access this information. So um, generally you're putting more effort into preservation digitization you're making sure your metadata is good, you're producing high quality scans, let's say. Whereas if it's for access purposes, maybe it's just quickly scanning a PDF for a researcher, you know. Um, and you don't really need to put much effort into preserving the access copies, uh, but you do want to put effort into preserving the outputs of digitization activities. And sometimes people forget that after digitization, there's more to do, which is to ensure that you can continue to access those files. Um, and so it's something to keep in mind. Another set of um, topics is on something called disk imaging, which is when you have a digital storage medium and you're trying to get data off of it into a safe copy. Um, there's a whole set of processes and tools for safely retrieving data from um, storage media like CDs, hard drives, floppy disks, flash drives, and more. Um, this requires the combination of hardware and a processing environment like BitCurator. And we have a guide called Handling Digital Archives Before Ingest, which goes into a lot of detail about um, these processes. This is, they're especially important for digital archivists who might be receiving donations on all sorts of storage media. And essentially the goal is to get the data off of those media so it can be further processed for preservation. And so I won't go into a great deal, um, great deal of detail into disk imaging today. But if you think back again to you know, those 
patterns of data on those storage media. Um, the job really is to try and interpret them <laughs> um, and, and get data off of those storage media because they often um, are at risk themselves, right? So certain formats have um, relatively short shelf lives, um, certainly compared with, with analog um, storage media like paper. Um, so floppy disks have, you know, 20 to 30 year lifespan. Um, and most of them are reaching the end of that lifespan. So if you have floppy disks in your institutional collections, you really should be getting the data off them now because um, they probably were created about 20 years ago or more. So next up is uh, the, essentially the in first level of any sort of preservation strategy, which is just keeping files safe um, and alongside assurances of, of integrity. And this is what we call bit level preservation. So bit level preservation is when you're running something called checksums against files um, and verifying them to be unchanged and then storing them in multiple locations. And I'm gonna break down both these things um, in a lot more detail. But first we'll get into checksums. You might ask, what is a checksum? Uh, a checksum is an algorithm um, that's run against a bit stream or file and it produces a unique alphanumeric string. Um, and they're based on the contents of that file. So when you change the file, the string also changes. Um, and that can be a good thing, right? If you're editing files, you want to be able to change the bit stream, right? You want to be able to change that sequence of bytes. But if you're trying to preserve them, the general idea is that they do not change, right? So you've brought something into your preservation environment and it remains completely unchanged into the future. Um, and there are different types of checksums that are available. Um, people can get into the weeds about what they mean and how they should be used, but there's a great report which is linked here called which, which checksum algorithm should I use that describes all of this in a lot more detail if you're interested. Here's an example though of, of what checksums look like. So this is a digitized photo of the Brock Monument, Niagara. Um, I ran an MD5 type checksum on July 1st, 2020, and it spit out that value, right? So it's CFA D8, yada, yada, yada. That's the alpha numeric string. I ran that checksum again a year later, and oh, the string's different, right? That's because the file changed. It looks like it may have been corrupted. You can see that it's been uh, altered in some way. It means that the bit streams that compose that photo were flipped around in some way, perhaps portions were lost. Um, and so therefore we know that that file has lost its integrity. So checksums establish fixity. It's the quality of knowing that a digital file hasn't been altered or changed in any way. Um, and so when a file has fixity and we have evidence of that, we can say that it's retained its integrity and therefore you can trust it, right? It has been altered maliciously or otherwise. Um, and that's the real goal of checksums. They're very simple in a way, fairly elegant, right? You know that a file's been changed or unchanged. The thing that it doesn't do, though, is like tell you how it's changed, right? Um, a checksum won't be able to point out where in a particular file um, some sort of change occurred. Um, and this type of preservation doesn't guarantee any form of um, accessibility or usability based on the format. You just know that the files haven't changed. That's the sole function here. And so when we're talking about bit level preservation, it essentially looks like this. You run checksums against preservation files at a certain time. You record the output and like when you did it. And then at a later date, you run that checksum check again, compare the output, record whether it's successful or not. And if it was not, then you have to pull another copy from another location, which is when we get into the storage part of bit level preservation. And institutions who are doing this work um, will do these checksum checks on a schedule based on the content context and the scale of the collections. It takes computing resources to do this and therefore energy, right? So it can be um, harmful for the environment if you're running constant checksum checks. Um, so, you know, you might time it in such a way uh, so that every month you're running these or maybe even a couple times a year, uh, really depends on, I think the level of risk, um, also the scale and the size. And checksums, I should say, are fundamental to computing generally as well. So they're, they're used a lot in cryptography. Um, I'm going to say the word blockchain once <laughs> in this webinar, but um, Bitcoin and other blockchain-based currencies and ledgers all use checksums essentially as, as central to their work, which is, again, why some 
people talk about the environmental impact of cryptocurrencies because they do take competing energy. One way to implement checksums really easily is um, by using any tool that implements something called the Bagot specification, which is a way of um, automatically generating and validating checksums. So bags act as envelopes for files and they add manifests listing the files in a package, the checksums, you can also add contextual metadata. There's a few tools linked here that create bags. Um, and it's really just a useful way of, of um, automating the creation of checksums. Um, you can use them for transfer workflows. So let's pretend that I want to create a bag, send it to you, and then you can validate it to say that, okay, everything that was on my computer was safely received by your computer. You can store digital files in kind of a semi-active state, um, a processing backlog in bags to make sure they haven't changed over that period of kind of waiting around for you to deal with them more. Um, bags are often used for transferring files to preservation processing systems. Again, to ensure that nothing was um, accidentally modified during transit. It's a really common way that um, files can lose integrity, right? If you're sending them from one place to another, you wanna make sure everything got there. And finally, um, many um, institutions store their archival packages in bag format. Um, this is the final output of a preservation workflow, right? You've got this package that you're putting somewhere safe and you can validate those packages over time, again, to ensure that they continue to have integrity. So I'll show you what a bag looks like very quickly here. I'm going to go back to my file browser um, and you can see um, we have this folder called preservation stuff. And within that folder, we've got a few different files here. I'm gonna use my terminal window. We can see this, let me zoom in a little bit. And I'm just gonna to get to that folder. So um, this tool is Bagot Python, which is um, supported by the Library of Congress. It's a command line tool for creating bags. But again, there are um, interfaces as well, different tools with graphical user interfaces you can use, but I prefer this one because it's really quick and easy. So if I tell it to create a bag and go and look at this folder again, it's changed, right? So our preservation files are in this folder called data here. And then we have the series of text files. Um, what they are, if we open it up, is a list of the, the files in that folder alongside checksums. It's pretty simple. Um, these are the very long SHA-512 type checksums. Um, and we can use this manifest, basically this text file, to check the bag again at a later time to ensure that nothing's changed. So if I were to go in and modify those files within that data folder and run a bag validation process, it would fail. And therefore we know, uh oh, something's changed, right? Um, simple, uh, relatively simple way of implementing checksums on this sort of automated scale. So I've talked about um, what happens if something goes wrong, and this is where the storage component really comes in. It's the other piece of bit-level preservation. Um, digital preservation is not only about storage, but there is no preservation without storage, right? You still have to keep data somewhere. Um, and preservation storage is distinct from storage for backup or access purposes largely because of the increased level of risk, right? Um, if these are your preservation copies, you wanna make sure you're keeping them well. And also the long timelines that we're talking about when it comes to preservation storage. Um, and there are different ways that you can approach preservation storage and they each have their pros and cons, which we'll go into. But one really useful resource for thinking about storage is using the NDSA levels of preservation. Um, this is a guidance document for preservation broadly, but they have a storage section within that guideline that has different levels of uh, preservation storage strategies. And it starts with level one, where you're having two complete copies in separate locations. And by locations, they mean um, slightly separate places. <laughs> so often you know, within the same region, ideally. Um, they do say a desktop and a hard drive in the same workspace is not two separate locations. But you know, maybe um, a server room at your library and you know, an external copy in remote offsite storage, that, that would be two locations. It's a little bit open to interpretation. As you move up the scale though, you can see that um, it's increasing the level of protection. Um, so you know, having three complete copies in a separate geographic location, so that could be another city, another region, 
Um, also think about the disaster threat to that particular place, right? So, you know, do you have copies spread across regions with different, you know, risks to those regions like, you know, uh, earthquakes or floods? Um, and you're trying also to diversify storage media too. So um, you wanna maybe have one copy in one type of storage media like the cloud and another in a different type of storage media like a tape backup. Um, people will differ on the number of copies to keep, um, anywhere from two to seven, uh, depending. Um, but the thing really is, is not necessarily always the number of copies, but also what sort of copies they are. So are they linked for availability and reliability? Um, are they just being replicated in a sort of uh, cloud network, which is, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, are they independent? You know, so they're in different storage media. So if you delete one, you still have the other. And of course, the geographic location thing comes in as well. So are they in the same place? You know, this, do you have a, two hard drives sitting next to one another on your desk? <laughs> Those have the same risk level, right? Um, different geographic locations uh, can really reduce the level of risk. I mentioned there are different media types that you can use uh, for preservation storage. Um, most, many institutions already use tape um, for IT backups and things like that. It's also very good for preservation. It's reliable, it's really high storage capacity. You can store a lot of data on tape, but it's also costly. It's fairly slow retrieval. Um, you have to refresh tapes on a pretty regular basis. So copy data from um, different generations, older generations of tape library formats to new ones. Um, and running fixity checks against tape can be more challenging as well if you wanna have a, a separate audit. Tape systems have their own internal fixity checking that you can generally rely upon, but if you want that extra level of assurance, it can be a bit more challenging. You're probably familiar with cloud storage. Um, there are other sorts of distributed networks for storage as well that are cloud-like essentially, and they can be cost efficient. Um, that's one of the pros of cloud storage generally. It's constantly accessible and it's highly reliable, right? Um, often there are multiple copies stored in, in different locations, although they're often linked. Um, the con is that it's not controlled by you. So you have to get to know your terms of service and the energy use can be high, right? So keeping this data available uh, at all times and in multiple locations ha you know, has energy impact. Uh, a very common setup is using local network storage, right? So this would be the storage that your IT folks provision for you, a share drive or something like that. It's easy to set this up locally um, because you often have access to this infrastructure, but it has a high cost. It may not have really high storage capacity. Um, IT units are often under pressure to um, reduce the amount of storage uh, because of that high cost. And you have to really be careful about your backup strategy, right? So are they um, creating nightly backups, but then writing them over the next day? Um, what's that schedule? So if you find a fixity error, you know, is there a backup that's going to have captured the good version um, or will just have overwritten the bad version, right? So keeping an eye on um, that sort of stuff, talking with IT folks is really required if you're using this method as, as a preservation storage strategy. Um, this is an example of a preservation resource for storage that we have uh, within OCL, a Terra Library Research Cloud. Um, it's a community cloud of five nodes uh, hosted at university data centers, um, Toronto, Ottawa, Queens, York, and Guelph. And we use the OpenStack Swift software to replicate three copies uh, across five nodes. So at any one time, there are three copies um, of a file between one of those five places. The focus here is on availability and redundancy. So um, those copies aren't independent. So if you were to delete uh, something from the OLRC, it removes it from uh, all those three places. Um, so, you know, it has advantages, right? It's, it's constantly available, um, but you want to make sure still that you're managing those files correctly and managing access to them so that you're not unintentionally deleting things. It does have its own internal fixity checking, um, but generally it's good to run uh, your own fixity checks against things stored in the cloud too, just to make sure that everything was uploaded properly. You kind of want to make sure that anything that got in was good. We also have a new DuraCloud um, service that adds additional preservation management features. You can replicate to additional storage services to add that extra geographic redundancy or storage media redundancy. And it performs its own independent fixity checks as well. Um, 
and it's priced out to OCO members. So you know, this is not to sell you on the OLRC necessarily, but um, it is a resource that's available and it's an example of how preservation storage uh, can be implemented. I've linked here to some other resources as well um, that might be useful in evaluating preservation storage, cloud services and things like that. So um, feel free to take a look at those after the webinar. But up next, we're gonna talk about key functions in digital preservation. So now we're getting into the nitty gritty, um, what preservation workflows actually do and look like. Checksums are really core to this. So, and we already talked about them. So we cover that part. Um, these are some other things that most preservation processing systems will do um, and things that you should do if you're developing your own preservation workflow. So um, file format identification is the first one. Highly recommended. It's probably the number one thing you should do. <laughs> file format validation, second. Um, recommended, but not required, I would say. We'll talk about additional characterization, which is useful, but it sort of depends on the materials at hand. And then normalization and migration, which again, uh, depends on context. So I'm going to walk through each of these in turn with examples so we can kind of see what they all look like. We'll start though with file format identification. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, file formats are rules, right? That establish how information is structured and stored. Um, you have these bit streams, zeros and ones in a series of patterns. Those patterns need to be interpreted in such a way that they create a file. Um, and if you standardize the way those patterns are interpreted, then you can move files around, right? Um, you can make those files understandable to different applications. You can send them to other people so they can open them. Um, file formats enable exchange, basically. And you, you know, are probably aware that some proprietary software applications like to lock in their users by using proprietary file formats, right? Which are specific to that software. Um, this was very, very common, especially in the early days of computing. Software companies would create their own formats, right? Um, not document them really properly. Uh, and you were kind of stuck with that software. And if you lost access to the software, well, you lost access to the files. Consumer demand has um, pushed software creators to generally adopt commonly used file formats. Um, and so now as a user, let's say if you use Google Drive, you can export your Google you know, slides or documents to PDF or Word. Um, and that's an expectation of users to be able to do that. The Google um, doc file is in another format entirely maintained by Google. Um, but they still allow you to import and export different formats. And that works for users, generally speaking. That said, there's still, I'm sure, lots of proprietary software packages out there, especially in like specialized fields um, that, that still lock users in in this way. And so adopting software always means thinking about an exit strategy as well. So it's something to keep in the back of your head. When we're talking about preservation, though, um, we're interested in knowing the file format to help us make preservation and access decisions. Um, knowing the file format helps us ensure A, that we can continue to give access to it using software, um, and B, um, send it out to users, right? And figure out what kind of format they may need these materials in as well. Um, and the key is to identify the file via something called its signature rather than its extension. Um, you can change extensions uh, of files very easily in most computers, they will let you do that. There's a more trustworthy way of identifying files, a more accurate way, and it's using these things called signatures, which is a series of bytes that occur in a predictable manner at the beginning of a file, um, sometimes at the end of a file too, often in combination. It's essentially you're looking for this pattern that should be present in all instances of that particular file format and version. So here's an example. So in, this is a screenshot of a PDF 1.5 file opened in a hex editor. So again, we can see those byte patterns. That series of um, values highlighted in gray, 25, 50, 44, et cetera, that translates to PDF 1.5 in ASCII text. <laughs> um, so it actually is interpretable. The rest you can see going down that line is like the gobbledygook of the, of the PDF, right? Um, other sorts of information that's interpreted by uh, software that's opening that PDF. But the very first part identifies it as a PDF 1.5 file. There's also an end of file, a marker that should occur at the end of the PDF file. 
And so if you are trying to identify any saw any tool that's um, performing file format identification, it's looking for these. Um, we have a really great resource called Pronom, which is a database of these signatures. Um, and so the screenshot here is of the entry for PDF 1.5 in Pronom. Um, it tells you where you should find the signature, what that value should be. And then tools implement this. So um, there are these two great tools for file format identification, two open source tools. One's called Siegfried and the other is called Fido. They both do similar things. Um, inspect files for these signatures and then give you information about them. I should note that um, plain text files, like the um, text file that said hi in it that we looked at earlier, they don't have signatures, right? It's just the text. And so you have to identify them using other ways, like their content or structure, um, their encoding, their extension. Um, and these tools will also do this work too. So I'm gonna pop out of the slides again for a minute. We can go back to my preservation example folder, pull up my terminal window again. I'm gonna run Siegfried, which uh, is another command line tool. Let's say we have this file called passage.bk exclamation mark. So if I try and open this on my Mac, I can't. Uh, it doesn't know what it is. It has this weird extension. Um, and how am I gonna know how to preserve this file if I don't even know what format it's in? Like how to, I can't figure out how to open it right now. So if we have Siegfried, we can drag and drop the file into the terminal window and it prints out the file format. So we scroll down here. You can see that's a word perfect file, version 5.1. It links to the Pronom database. So if I were to search Pronom using this identifier, it would pull up the description for word perfect. And it's told me how um, it's identified that file using a series of um, bytes at this position in this file. So now that we know it's a word perfect file, so then you can figure out how to open it, right? Um, we can run LibreOffice, for example, which will open WordPerfect files. We can convert it using LibreOffice 2 to some other formats so that we can give access to it to, um, for a user. And so any preservation workflow will be running one of these tools, very likely Siegfried, it's a backbone of most of this work, um, to identify file formats, um, spit them out into metadata, and then help us manage them. So after file format identification, we have file format validation. This um, is the process of determining if a file is following the rules of its file format specification. So um, quite a few file formats have um, the structural rules for how they're supposed to be created, published. Um, you know, PDF, for example, has the standard way of how a PDF should be constructed. Um, same with JPEG and TIFF and other formats. Um, you know, as I said, software should be creating files in formats according to these rules, and they should be following these rules correctly, right? Um, but you know, not everyone does so. <laughs> Some people maybe who are creating software are cutting corners, right? And so the question is always, uh, is this a good version of this particular format? Um, if you've ever opened a, tried to open a corrupted file on your computer, you might've gotten an error saying you can't open it. It means that something's wrong with the way this, that file has been constructed. That series of bytes isn't conforming to the way that your piece of software is expecting it to. Um, and so we have this test, is a file well-formed and valid? A well-formed file obeys what are called the syntactic rules of its file format. So it follows the structure that's set out by the file format standard. And then a valid file is first well-formed. So it has to pass that first test. And then it meets a higher level semantically defined rules. So certain quality standards, such as minimum bit depth, for example. Um, as before, we have a bunch of tools that will do uh, file format validation, generally according to format. So there's one called Joe, which well, will validate a variety of formats. Bear PDF, which is specifically for the PDF A version of PDF. Um, this is really important for uh, government bodies, especially who are often replacing a lot of their record creation and keeping with PDFA format. And you want to make sure that the software that's making those files is doing a good job, basically. So Bear PDF was developed for that purpose. Um, and there's also a tool called MediaConch, which will verify a particular format of video and audio encoding. And this one's especially useful um, for institutions who are using um, digitization providers 
uh, you know, outsourcing digitization of your tape collection, let's say. And you want to make sure that that um, provider is doing a good job in the creation of those files. So you could use MediaConch to validate um, those digitized copies. So if I pop out again, I'm going to open up Jove. Um, it does have a slight graphical user interface. So it's not much to look at. <laughs> we have this Jove logo here. Um, first, I'm going to select the module to validate against. And you can see this is the list of uh, file types that can validate. So PDF is one of them. And if we drag and drop this PDF into the window, it will give me an output that says it's well formed, but not valid. So that means it's following the structure of the PDF file format, but something about the quality is missing. Um, this is a file from the Scholars Portal TDR. You know, you can open it just fine. Uh, it's readable, so you know, no issues there. But the, the problem with its validity is that um, it has hyperlinks, which um, don't resolve. The, those links are broken. Um, and so as a result, it fails this validation process. Is this a big deal? Not really. You know, you can open up the file just fine. Um, affects usability to a certain extent, but not super seriously. Um, in other cases, though, uh, a failure at this point would indicate uh, that the file is fully corrupted, right? If it's if it fails both well formedness and validity, it's usually corrupted, um, and therefore we would at Skulls Portal if this comes up, we go back to the producer of the PDF and say, "Give us a new one, basically. Please regenerate this article." All right, so that was validation. Uh, next, we will talk briefly about characterization. Characterization really just translates into any other kind of information you want to extract from files. Um, anything else that you might be interested in knowing about a particular file. So that could include metadata that was added by a user, right? So um, maybe there's an author assigned or title of a document, keywords. Um, software adds lots of metadata, so you can get creation and modification times, which is important for archival description, for example. Um, geolocations get added as well, which I'll show in a minute um, sometimes. And there's lots of metadata, technical metadata about the file's contents based on its format. So you can get information about you know, pixel width and length for photographs, or the bit rate for video, or the color system that's being used for video, or the encoding method for video and audio, which is all important for digitization workflows and having information about your files. And you'll see again, there's a series of tools that will do characterization for different formats. Um, there's a great tool called EXIF tool. Oops. Um, developed by uh, someone at Queens. And this tool is specifically for extracting. You can also um, edit photograph metadata. So if, again, we'll go back to our folder here. I'm going to drag and drop this JPEG image. Um, and you can see it has printed out a whole bunch of information about this particular picture. Um, we get modification times. So this is when it was last modified, 2018. You can see the type of camera it was taken on, which is an iPhone. Lots of information about the, the particular you know, technical characteristics of a photograph here. Um, and way down at the bottom, we also have geolocation information. So um, I had location services turn on my phone when I took this picture and it encoded the exact location of where it was taken. Very interesting, possibly. <laughs> um, if you are uh, performing archival description, let's say, um, you know, very rarely with analog materials would you get the exact spot where a photograph is taken. Um, on the other hand, could constitute a privacy issue, right? If I was a donor of this file to an archive, I wouldn't want you just sending this out if this was recording the location of my home, for example. And so here's an example of where characterization gives you some information about the files that assist in their management, right? Um, maybe retain this in the preservation copy, but in an access copy, you can use a tool like EXIF tool to strip this information out, for example. Um, so it's useful often to have this information to, to inform uh, management over time. Um, 
All right, so the last section uh, of functions is around normalization and migration. And this is slightly different. In those last three, we were talking about extracting metadata, um, getting information about files. Here we're talking about making copies in different formats. Um, and so if you know the original format, right, then you may want to make a decision about making a copy in a different format. Um, and there are a few different purposes for this, but the main question is, is, you know, is conversion possible? Do you have a tool that will make the conversion? Um, and what gets changed in the process? And is this change acceptable to you? Um, does something get lost, right, in converting from one file format to another? There's a slight difference in the terms here. So when we're talking about normalization, we're talking to converting to a standard set of formats on ingest into the preservation system. So as a archive, you may say, okay, every time we get a Word document, we're gonna make a copy in PDF. Why you might do that is up to for debate. We can talk about that. Um, the various decisions that one might, make, what one might make around conversions, um, but the process of normalization happens at the time of receipt, basically, or time of processing. Migration happens later. So this is a point when um, in the future, Let's pretend that uh, the word doc format is no longer supported by Microsoft. You can't find software as easily to open it. That might be a time when you're saying, oh, okay, I actually need to convert these files to a new format to continue to ensure access. And so using that metadata where you've extracted those file format identifications in your repository, um, you would then say, okay, I'm gonna convert all of the instances of doc format to PDF at this point or to some other format that's uh, more easily supported. So it's kind of a like, do I do it now? Do I do it later? Sort of question and different institutions have different approaches to this. When we're talking about what's lost too, um, we have to think about, you know, what was the original look like? Um, what do we want an output to look like? And so in the left here, we have that same WordPerfect file that's being um, opened up in WordPerfect. That's what it looked like in WordPerfect. If you were running that software in the 90s, you open up this file, that's what it looked like to you. The PDF version that LibreOffice will create is different, right? Um, it's more, looks more familiar, like a document that you would want to read. <laughs> um, it has the same general formatting in a way, um, you know, and might be suitable for, for users of one kind if they just want to read the manuscript, right? This is the PDF output, you know, they can sit down and read it. If they really want to know what it looked like to the creator of that manuscript, well, then you maybe go, you, you go back to the software. Um, the other key distinguishing feature is um, between normalization for preservation and access. So when we're normalizing for preservation, we're creating a copy, always a copy in a new format. Um, and you keep that in the preservation package. And you always retain the original, just in case. You just don't wanna get rid of the original because again, things could get lost in conversion, even for preservation. And so then you have two copies that you're maintaining into the future. For access, this is when you're focused on your users, right? So what do users need out of a copy, right? Do they want to just read the manuscript? Do they want to interact with the software, which is we'll talk about in a second. A really common example would be if you've scanned a map collection, you've got these huge TIFF files, probably really high quality. You can zoom in on every little detail, um, but they're, they're big, right? They're hard to um, make available over the internet. You wouldn't just attach it to an email. Um, be much too large to do that. And so you create an access copy in JPEG, smaller, more easily manipul manipulable. You can put it in a repository or a website. That's access normalization. Um, you always keep the TIFF copy. That's your original, it's your preservation version. You're putting that in storage. You're really focused on making sure it's safe. And you can create access copies as much as you like, depending on what your users need. Um, and it's much more flexible, a set of concepts. Again, same thing, various tools that are linked here that will do conversion of different file formats. Um, and these are commonly, again, implemented in various systems. I've been talking a bit about maintaining access to software. So this is what's called emulation. Um, so this is when you're not only maintaining the original file, but you're also maintaining the original software and operating systems and running them together in a current computing system. Um, this is a really useful strategy um, if you have files um, and software that are really tied closely to hardware, like they had to operate in a certain kind of computer, <laughs> sometimes that was the case with early computers. Um, it also works really well for really complex um, files or um, objects, I guess we would call them like databases or websites where there are lots of interacting pieces, right? 
Um, it doesn't really work to manage those on a file by file basis. Um, video games are another really good example where they're complex, interactive, um, digital objects. You can't, it's not just like a file that you can save in your computer um, commonly. And so you're using emulation as a means of um, persisting that, that kind of interaction. Um, there are lots of tools and resources being developed for this particular area. Um, a really great center of this is in the EASY project, which is supported by the Software Preservation Network. This is a whole area to itself, right? Um, it's really exciting and interesting stuff going on. Uh, the, the sort of tool state is not quite as advanced, um, but there's been just a lot of work over the last few years on this. So it's an exciting area of development. And here's a nice example too of, of where emulation gives you a different experience. So this is a manuscript by Margaret Atwood of a short story called Dance of the Lepers, um, which is located, stored at the Thomas Fisher Library. It's part of the Atwood papers, came in on a floppy disk. And the file can be opened in a text editor. And you can see on the left side, it's got a bunch of gar gobbledygook um, at the start to do with, I think, how that file was um, structured by the software that created it. But you can read the contents relatively fine. On the right side, this is that same file opened up in a version, an emulated version of MacWrite 2, which is the software that Margaret I would use to write this short story. Um, and so you can see what it looked like to her when she was writing it. Um, that's what that software looked like. You could interact with the file even if you wanted. I'm obviously not editing the original because that would be a big mistake. <laughs> um, thanks, by, by the way, to my colleague Bart, um, who ran this um, emulation himself. It's pretty fun to look at, though, and kind of cool. So these are two options for access, right? Um, one is really focused on the content. Uh, the other is focused on not only the content, but also the experience, right? And so for different kinds of materials, two different strategies might be necessary. All right, so that's been lots of information. We've really just done like a, a walkthrough over many kind of core functions, concepts, and preservation. The last few slides are going to kind of bring it all together, and then we'll have uh, lots of time for questions. So we've been talking about these different steps of digital preservation workflows as discrete steps, right? One file, one action, here's what it looks like. A reasonable person would probably be interested in knowing how you automate this, how you link them together. And so um, we have various tools that will do this. Preservation processing uh, tools essentially are chaining all these steps into a workflow that's repeatable across many, many files. So that's what we do with the permafrost service. We host a tool called Archivmatica, which is one preservation processing tool. And if you upload data into Archimatica, it will run through all these different steps on a set of files and extract that metadata, um, as well as perform those normalization uh, functions as well. Um, and there are other tools out there too, some of them proprietary. Um, so there's a, a tool called Preservica. That's a proprietary tool that you can buy that basically does the exact same thing. Um, not an open source version, equally, I think, effective as Archimatica though, has lots of other features for access built in. So different institutions will choose different sorts of tools for this purpose, but they're all doing basically the same thing. Metadata creation and management though is really key, right? Um, so any tool that is chaining all these functions together um, is creating metadata records with that preservation metadata that we extracted from those files, right? We also wanna be able to track our objects over time. Um, and there are different formats for expressing preservation metadata. Um, two link standards are called METS and PREMIS. Uh, I won't go into the details of how those standards work here, um, but a tool like Archimatica implements them. So it creates these XML files with all this technical metadata encoded within those standards. In the Scholars Portal TDR, we implement something like METS and PREMIS. Um, they're complex standards and quite top heavy, I would say. And so um, we've implemented a version of those things for ourselves that's a bit easier to manage, but you can always sort of crosswalk to those standards if required. And so um, for materials in the Scholars Portal TDR, you can actually go to our um, journals or books website. And if you come across an item that's been preserved by us, you can click on preservation metadata option and it will bring up the TDR record that we maintain. So for the Scholars Portal TDR, we have these XML files for each object in the repository with the same sort of metadata 
checksums, file form identification, validation results, right? Um, it's presented in a nice way in the interface, but it has the same sort of format as you see below with this XML file um, in the back end. And we maintain this large database of these records, basically. The other key piece is indexing, right? So if you have all this preservation metadata, um, you wanna be able to search across it, retrieve information, maybe link out to uh, the preservation copy and storage, as well as maybe an access copy, maybe gather statistics about your preservation metadata. So like how many PDFs do I have? How many JPEGs do I have? Um, this is an area where there's not a lot of useful tools yet developed. Um, there aren't comprehensive out of the box projects uh, for this purpose. Um, digital asset management systems or DAMSs generally are still focused on access, um, presentation of digital objects to users, right? They're not really completely implementing preservation functions in this way. Um, and so I think we're still sort of waiting for that indexing feature to come along. Um, some tools are in development, um, but it's, it's kind of an imperfect area at this point. Um, internally at Scholars Portal, we can do that kind of work with our, our MarkLogic database. Um, but we don't generally make that available to users, although maybe one day there might be an interest in that. Thinking about how to chain all these things together too might make you think like, okay, if I'm not, we're not doing preservation at our institution, how do we start? The most best <laughs> way to start is doing an inventory, figuring out what you have in your collections that are that's in digital format. Um, and then figure out you know, what it is that you want to preserve, right? Um, we have a, I have a template that I've developed for this purpose. It's linked here. You can download it. It's an Excel format. Start filling it out. And it just asks really basic questions like, what is this stuff? What format is it in? How big is it? Just helps you start thinking about, you know, what are in our collections that need preservation? And once you have that listing, it can be really basic, you know, just like oh, we have a bunch of CDs with, um, I don't know, GIS metadata or GIS data um, stored on them. Um, or we have a bunch of floppy disks in the archives, right? Um, they're in this collection. Once you start identifying what you have in your institution that um, is important to preserve, then you can start asking some real questions, right? So um, can you access the files where are they stored? What formats are they possibly in? Um, even just a broad guess before you really check out those formats in a more detailed way using a preservation workflow. Um, which of these are the most valuable or at risk? Like if we lost them, it would be a big deal. Um, it would cost a lot to replace them or they would be irreplaceable. Um, in the case of costing a lot to replace, that really includes a lot of di digitized materials, right? Institutions put enormous resources into scanning and digitizing materials. And if they were to lose them, they would have to repay to do that. And that assumes that the analog original is still accessible, which you know sometimes it's not. So this is a plug, I guess, for preserving the outputs of digitization projects as well. You should think about conversions for preservation and access and what you might want to retain after those conversions. So what's important to your users. Rights are really important to consider as well. So do you have the rights to do this work? Um, you know, were they donated to your institution? Did you acquire them some other way? Um, libraries have um, rights within the Copyright Act to perform format conversions, for example. Um, so you're generally covered under those rights, but it's um, often a good thing to double check, um, specifically with um, materials where you don't own the copyright or the copyright hasn't been transferred to you. Um, having descriptive metadata is important as well. So you know if you don't know what these files are, <laughs> you don't have any descriptive information in your catalog or archival finding aids, um, you probably want to start by pulling some of that together. Um, and then, of course, doing preservation requires work, right? Uh, what resources do you have to do this work? Who is going to do it at your institution? If you don't really want to fund it and you don't have anyone to do the work, you probably aren't in the game of doing preservation. Um, you know, it has to be something that your institution is committed to doing. Finally, you want to think about where you want to store these preservation copies as well, if you have what sort of storage resources you have, um, and of course, thinking about the costs associated with that. So um, recommendations for starting the preservation journey, um, starting with small, not super complicated collections to build skills in this are really helpful. Um, I often see institutions start with photograph collections. They're often high value. 
Um, again, lots of resources were put into digitizing photograph collections a lot of the time. It's a good place to start. The perfect is also the enemy of the good. So, you know, doing bit level preservation is better than nothing. Um, in fact, it's, it's great. <laughs> it's the first step uh, for any sort of um, preservation program. Um, keeping valuable files in a shared drive folder called do not delete is the enemy of all that is good. So <laughs> if you can at least make do something good um, for those files to ensure that it will be, they'll be protected in some way, that's better than just assuming that everything will be OK. Um, as I might have implied a few times over this webinar, preservation is a process, not a one-time event. It should be funded like a program, not a project. Um, preservation cannot really be easily funded through grants. Um, you wouldn't fund your reference services from a one-time grant and then just stop providing reference after the grant ran out. In the same way, uh, you should be funding preservation as an ongoing function. If it's, again, if it's within the mandate of your institution. If the institution doesn't have a mandate to preserve things, it's not interested really in um, performing a preservation function, then that's okay. Lots of institutions don't preserve things, right? Public libraries are often not in the game of preservation. Um, and that's all right. They provide many other valuable services. <laughs> the other rule um, is to do no harm. So um, make sure that you've got processes in place where you're not accidentally deleting or modifying files. Um, otherwise, everything else depends on your resources, priorities, and, and policies. I've linked here to some good readings and resources. Um, if you're just interested in introductory reading around digital preservation, I especially like this book by Trevor Owens, The Theory and Craft of Digital Preservation. It's a really, just really interesting readable guide about digital preservation. He's written a book that I wish was um, in place when I started. I just wanted something that I could like dive into and, and um, understand in a plain sort of language way. So I'd, I'd highly recommend that book. And a lot of these other resources are too are quite um, accessible in terms of, of uh, their lack of jargon and readability. So I'd encourage you to, to link out to those. That reaches uh, the end for me. Um, but of course the work of preservation is never done. <laughs> But um, I'm always happy to talk about digital preservation with anyone in this community. Um, if this has made you feel things. I'm happy to chat. I have lots of time for questions and discussion as part of this webinar. But if you ever like to reach out um, and discuss your institutional situation, use cases, how you might use the tools that we offer at Scholars Portal or, or otherwise, um, I'm more than happy to answer your questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and I will await your thoughts and feelings about digital preservation. Thank you, Grant. So we're going to stop the recording now. Um, the part up to this point will be made uh, public and then our Q&A session will not be recorded. So feel free to ask any questions that you have. So thank you for your attention and thank you, Grant, for your presentation. And now I will stop the recording. <laughs>